The release of a new Final Fantasy is always a special occasion in my book, with new worlds to explore, characters to meet, and battles to fight, all paired with a world-class soundtrack and an always sharp presentation. It's what we've come to love about the series. There's that moment when you begin a new Final Fantasy where an almost hushed silence comes over you as if breathlessly awaiting an orchestra to begin its performance. You hear that fresh yet familiar overture theme and begin your journey. Moments like this are special, but something that has become fleeting in today's world of day one patches, game stopping bugs, and server logins. And yet somehow, against the odds, Square Enix's latest production gives us a glimpse of what gaming can still offer. Final Fantasy XVI arrives in excellent condition, giving players exactly the experience the developers intended from the beginning. It's one of the most polished games I've reviewed yet this year. So today we're going to explore the game and its impressive presentation, breaking down the ways in which it succeeds. We'll discuss the visuals, the audio, and the technology behind it. Now it's not 100% perfect as evidenced by its performance mode, which we'll cover later in this video, but it's as close to a perfect release as we've seen in a long time. So with that in mind, let's begin. Unlike most long-running series, each mainline Final Fantasy is a unique entry, and Final Fantasy XVI is no different. Helmed by creative Business Unit 3 within Square Enix, XVI is a gorgeous action RPG that plays with expectations for the series even more than usual. It's fast, it's action-driven, and the story is dark and political, resembling the likes of Vagrant Story and Final Fantasy XII to some degree. As is series tradition, Final Fantasy XVI is built using technology created just for this game. Well, at least in part. Square has been remarkably tight-lipped about the technology powering this game. But given the team's history, it seems likely that it's at least related in part to the work done on Final Fantasy XIV, though obviously greatly enhanced. As a PlayStation 5 exclusive then, the development team has had the freedom to implement new features designed for this hardware platform. It's not the most cutting edge experience on the market, mind you, but what's here is so remarkably solid that it's hard not to be impressed. For the sake of clarity, I'm going to break this video up into categories. We'll begin with the game's cast, looking at character rendering and animation. Then we'll explore its vast and beautiful environments, followed by its technical performance, such as frame rate and resolution, before discussing other aspects of the overall presentation, including audio. In approaching this game, I feel it's best to reflect on Square Enix's approach to character rendering, scene composition, and how the development team marries this with its own unique designs. It strikes a far more subdued tone with natural hues that require a careful eye to fully appreciate, so it may not jump out in the same way as, say, the Final Fantasy VII Remake. With this in mind, let's begin with the characters. As a story-driven series, characters are the heart and soul of Final Fantasy, and that remains true in 16. This new game features exceptionally detailed and expressive models, packed to the brim with micro-detail. The development team has reached a point where the real-time cutscenes they've created for this game are beginning to resemble pre-rendered videos of the past. The discussion around these models has been interesting to watch from the sidelines as well. It seems that the perception of quality varies more than usual. You see, some people were very impressed with the demo, such as myself, while others are perhaps less so. Why is that? Well, I think it has to do with this stylistic approach they've taken to character design. These characters are not intended to be completely photorealistic. They're basically focused on the Square Enix house style of character design. Fancy hair, smooth skin, and detailed outfits are key, but at the same time, Final Fantasy XVI is perhaps more grounded than usual, striking this interesting middle ground as a result. The facial and hair rendering certainly stand out to me. The face texture feels reasonably realistic, and it stands out in scenes where dynamic lights dance naturally across the surface, revealing whiskers and pores alike. 
For the hair, they do not use any sort of high-end strand type system, rather just the usual alpha texture cards, but the design is sublime nonetheless. Clothing and armor also boast beautifully crafted materials. Leather, fabric, and metal all have realistic properties despite the stylized designs. The interplay between these materials is key. Note how light is reflected and scattered across Clive's armor compared to the more diffuse light across his leather sheath and under armor. Or in this scene, note the rim light along Clive's left arm coming from the candle in front of him. Or, when he turns around about to leave the building, the light from outside floods into the room and realistically illuminates his armor according to material properties. This shot during the prologue also shows what I mean. Note the fine stitching on his coat, the difference in how firelight reflects on his armor versus the fabric. All of this is super well done. Or how about the king's outfit in this scene? The red cloth realistically simulates Fresnel. You can almost feel the scratchiness of this material. Compare it to, say, his leather arm guards and you should see what I'm talking about. This is a real triumph for the artists that worked on this game. The interplay between these materials feels absolutely sublime. But the secret to Final Fantasy XVI's character presentation lies in its command of shadow. Pay close attention and you'll note how every piece of clothing casts a clean, precise shadow across the model. The shadow quality is what truly elevates the presentation to almost CGI levels. The question is, how does this work? Well, it's something I've had a difficult time answering for sure, but the key finding is that the shadows in this game have the characteristics of ray traced shadows rather than traditional shadow maps. Now, they could be using another method as well, including virtual shadow maps like in Unreal Engine 5 or even sample distribution shadow maps, but either way, the result is what matters. So what does this mean in practice? Well, when it comes to characters, this helps explain why the self shadows are so clean and devoid of artifacts. Resolving detail this fine is rather difficult with traditional shadow maps, remember. It looks utterly pristine in Final Fantasy 16. These shadows also have proper contact hardening, so the closer you are to the shadow caster, the sharper and more defined the shadows. And looking at the ground here, note how Clive's shadow appears sharpest just near his feet, but slowly becomes more diffuse at a distance. But of course, what good is a detailed character without fluid animation? This is where we come to the general cutscene presentation. Final Fantasy XVI's main sequences are among the best in the business, but it's not always perfect. You see, as in many large story-driven games, scenes will have different weight according to the importance of its content. An epic showdown between the player and a key villain, for instance, is obviously more important than small talk with a shopkeeper, right? The problem is, if there's a large gap in quality between the two types of sequences, it can feel rather jarring. Now, this is something that Horizon Forbidden West nailed. Its main cutscenes were supremely well directed, of course, but it's the idle chit chat with NPCs that impressed me the most. The strong facial expressions and body language really communicate emotion to the player in a way that Horizon Zero Dawn did not. They developed a powerful new scripting tool just to handle these scenes, and it's a huge success. But unfortunately, this level of fidelity is relatively uncommon even today, and most games present their B and C tier sequences, as I like to call them, as little more than character models standing next to one another, bobbing their heads and moving their hands. So, how well did Square Enix do with Final Fantasy XVI? Well, let's begin with the A tier cutscenes. Most of the game's story beats are told using these exceptionally detailed, beautifully directed cinematics. The combination of high detail models, smooth animation with minimal clipping, alongside the excellent per pixel motion blur, and glorious bokeh depth of field, really sets these scenes apart. The best thing is, most of them are real time. I say most because there are exceptions. That impressive battle sequence at the start of the game, for instance, it does switch to pre-rendered video sandwiched between two real-time clips. Thankfully, the bitrate is so high that it's difficult to tell in practice, but there you go. They even go so far as to represent the contortion of skin and muscle as characters speak. The way their brow furrows and skin folds as they speak is very impressive. But yeah, these scenes are some of the best the Square Enix has ever produced, which is why the B and C tier sequences can feel slightly below par as a result. 
What I mean is, when talking with the various characters throughout the world, you're presented with a simplified scene like this. Your party may stand around, moving their hands, bobbing their heads, and little else. It's all reasonably well animated, but it lacks the polish of the primary cutscenes. The C-tier scenes then are typically found with side characters like this where you get a box of text with an occasional spoken word. Honestly, it's all rather standard stuff and it's exactly like what we saw in the Final Fantasy VII Remake, but when you go from this to this, it can feel a little jarring. Still, despite that nitpick, the overall presentation of Final Fantasy XVI's cast is of excellent quality and one of Square Enix's greatest achievements to date. Yes, it really is that good. Of course, there's more to animation than just the cutscenes, and Final Fantasy XVI largely succeeds in gameplay as well. Character movement can feel slightly odd at first, what with the bounding box in which Clive can freely move, but you do get used to it and slowly begin to appreciate the animation intricacies, including proper foot IK and dramatic lurches as you swing your weapon. As a result, the combat feels sublime. Clive moves effortlessly, dancing around the scene as particles burst forward from your attacks, each triggering an explosive showcase of lighting. If you pay close attention to Clive's gear, note the robust cape physics and the way in which clipping is minimized. The sword feels plausibly attached to his back via a sheath. It's not just floating, nor are his clothes clipping through it constantly, like in many other games. Final Fantasy XVI also does a great job with transitioning between cutscenes and gameplay. You'll be presented with these glorious real-time cutscenes, which then seamlessly feed directly into combat. And they do this all the time. It looks awesome. But there is one divisive aspect to all of this, the motion blur. Now personally, I'm a huge fan of the motion blur in this game, along with the selected shutter speed. It accentuates Clive's every move and lends the game a cinematic quality that elevates the overall presentation. I saw no issues with this off the bat. However, based on feedback from the demo, it's clear that not everyone agrees. And this is where I feel the developers have let certain players down. The option to disable motion blur should be made available in the options menu, at least during gameplay. So if you were bothered by this in the demo, unfortunately, the full game does not change anything in that regard. Still, overall, everything about the character rendering and the animation, from cutscenes to gameplay, is, I feel, a victory. Yet there's so much more to Final Fantasy XVI's visual design, which brings us to the next topic, the environments. Throughout the development of Final Fantasy XVI, there were many questions regarding the size of the game's world. The developers noted that it would not be an open world game, but what does that mean for its design and practice, and how well does it hold up visually? Well, the good news is that by and large, these environments are beautiful and interesting to explore. It's not an open world per se, but many of the areas are directly connected to one another, creating the illusion of a large explorable space. The key here is that this world is divided into several large chunks, which enables additional variation in design. This variety really adds a lot to the game. You'll experience magnificent medieval cities, underground fortresses, small settlements nestled among beautiful ruins, vast open fields, and scorching deserts to name a few. Fast travel points are accessed from this overworld map, but these points are often grouped together. For instance, these points make up one large explorable area. You can start from here and go all the way across the map on foot if you wish, seamlessly. There is no dynamic time of day, so the lighting appears to have been baked out as light maps. There are variable times of day and different weather conditions of course, but these all occur based on story progress. The advantage of baking out your lighting is that you can achieve some pretty dramatic results. Like this entryway within the castle, the light spills from outside into the interior space, indirectly lighting the surroundings. This is coupled with a robust ambient occlusion solution that ensures that objects close to surfaces, or other objects in fact, have natural shadowy depth. This presents objects from looking as if they're just floating in the scene. I was also impressed with the way natural shadows form beneath overhangs and crevices within these spaces. 
Areas beneath the arches, for instance, are properly shadowed. The same is true of outdoors as well. Wandering through this forest environment, note the darkening within the thicket where leaves and branches intersect. This is something I've often thought about, the subtle shadowing and shading within an environment and the importance to the overall presentation. While covering this game, the demo version of Lies of P dropped, and hallways in that game instantly reminded me of just how important indirect lighting and proper ambient shadows can be. Note how this darkened area is filled with unrealistic bright specular versus the much more grounded Final Fantasy XVI. Beyond the lighting and shadows though, many of these places are just packed to the brim with fine detail. The environments make liberal use of geometry, with high density meshes and detailed textures used to create each scene. Paths and stone walls alike are intricately decorated. Structures like this subterranean temple, for instance, reach out into the world above, creating a tremendous sense of scale, all with these perfectly chiseled geometric intricacies. The beautiful lighting of the volcano, which combines the deep blue hues with fiery oranges and reds, also impresses, or perhaps this other underground fortress with individual torches placed carefully along its many balconies as the heart of the crystal behind it emanates light. But perhaps one of the most important details lies here in this vineyard. Ah, the grapes. In a world of pixels where beauty takes shape, low poly young grapes with edges so straight, with limited vertices they stand tall and proud in a digital realm where art is avowed. Yes, there was a time when fans of Final Fantasy XIV took up arms against the low polygon grapes in the game. And it seems that the developers truly did take this complaint to heart, as the vineyard boasts thousands of individually modeled grapes nestled between bundles of leaves. Behold the grapes of 16, their skins smooth and delicate, a touch of grace, with a subtle sheen reflecting nature's embrace, so delightful and luscious their aroma, a tantalizing symphony for the senses. Thus, I would like to take this moment to bestow the award for the best grapes in video game history to Creative Business Unit 3. Truly, we have witnessed polygonal perfection, each rendering a testament to the designer's flair. Okay, but beyond the actual geometric detail, there's also great use of motion within these environments. A nice wind simulation allows grass and trees alike to shake and tremble before you, while large scripted explosions can sometimes rip scenery apart before your eyes, which looks really impressive. I mentioned shadows earlier in relation to character rendering, but it's also important for the environments. Thanks to contact hardening, the distance of objects from the surface determines how diffuse a shadow might be. In this scene, for instance, Clive's shadow is sharp, owing to his proximity to the surface, but the structure above him is casting a far more diffuse shadow. The same is true of these palm trees here in the desert. Then you have these dramatic moments when you fill the darkness with a magical ball of fire as soft shadows dance across the scene during exploration. It's beautiful. And of course, I was impressed with these highly diffuse ambient shadows as well that are often seen in low light environments. Even in darkness, the game manages to ground its characters within the scene. And if you recall, when I reviewed Forspoken earlier this year, this was very specifically one of the main issues with that game. Another key feature that deserves a quick mention is the particle system. Ethereal particles effortlessly glide through the scene as torches dance and flicker around you. The use of fire greatly enhances many a scene in this game, especially during combat, with deep orange hues often bringing the world to life. It's great stuff. And all of this sounds great, but I do have some nitpicks to raise as well. Firstly, the visuals tend to be at their best in these dim or indirectly lit scenes. The brighter, more directly lit areas are a little less impressive, I feel. This desert city or these open fields at noon, for instance, more readily resemble Final Fantasy XIV's visuals, I feel. It's not to say they look bad, but it all still feels a little bit cross-gen, if you will. Water too is a mixed bag. The larger oceans are gorgeous, with undulating waves and sunlight playing across the surface, contributing to the atmosphere. Also, the color of water used in these springs scattered around the desert is beautiful. But then you have smaller bodies like this that are less impressive primarily due to mediocre screen space reflections. 
Still, when everything comes together, you're left with some of the most impressive sequences I've seen in a long time. The icon battles, in particular, combine richly detailed backdrops, all exploding apart before you, with impressively articulated, high-detail models duking it out, alongside special effects galore. It's marvelous, and the scale is off the charts. This is the kind of battle that recent God of War games shied away from, and seeing something like this in Final Fantasy XVI truly tickles the senses. I think it also showcases why I love motion blur in this game so much. You just can't achieve this look without it. The speed of objects whipping past the camera is accentuated by the effect, and it really brings the whole scene together. At its best, Final Fantasy XVI sings. Alas, as we continue our exploration of the game, depending on your settings, it may not always be at its best. Thus far, I've had a lot of positive things to say about the presentation in this game, but this is the part of the video where I begin to take issue with certain decisions, specifically in regards to image quality and performance. Like many other games these days, Final Fantasy XVI offers players the choice between a quality mode and a performance mode. Both modes use an aggressive dynamic resolution scaling system, with quality mode typically ranging between 1080p up to 1440p, then spatially upscaled to 4K. Performance mode in comparison seems to top out at 1080p but often drops a lot lower, knocking on the door of 720p from what I can tell. This is combined with TAA to reduce the shimmering and noise, but the performance mode doesn't really look great. Of course, all this is perfectly normal for games these days. Many titles deploy reconstruction techniques to take a low internal resolution and make it look acceptable on a 4K display. The problem with Final Fantasy XVI is that, based on subjective analysis of the still shots at least, we think the game might be using AMD's much maligned FSR1. All the telltale signs are there, and these include the swirling circle-like patterns evident in many scenes. It doesn't look great. Now, in quality mode, the resolution is high enough that, by and large, it's not a huge issue. It still looks pretty clean, but the performance mode is kind of a mess once the resolution starts dropping. It's just a screen full of noisy artifacts and blur that looks terrible. Frankly, this solution isn't up to the task and was a bad choice by the developers. Speaking of performance and quality modes though, there are other changes beyond resolution, so let's look more closely at that. Shadow quality takes a significant hit with more visible dithering and a reduction in distant shadow quality. Remember, in quality mode, one of the benefits to their shadow solution is the lack of visible cascade transitions. Pop-in also seems to have been increased in some areas, though both modes use time-sliced animations for distant enemies, likely to reduce CPU load in the larger fields. Perhaps in this YouTube video, when shrunken down, the performance mode looks okay enough, but when played on an actual television, I find that it just doesn't hold up to close scrutiny. I hope they can find some way to implement something other than FSR1. Of course, if performance mode delivered a stable frame rate, I'd be a lot less likely to complain. After all, sacrifices are necessary when aiming for a higher frame rate, but is that the case here? Well, users quickly discovered that performance mode doesn't run well in the demo version, but there was some hope in that the demo uses an older build. Beyond that, despite announcing that the game would not have a day one patch, the team did opt to release a small 300 megabyte patch which promises performance improvements, and we've tested it. Now before I get into those performance mode numbers, I do want to mention the quality mode. This is the mode I recommend playing in right now. It targets 30 frames per second, yes, but it's a very steady experience, at least in most situations. There are instances where it can dip, but 99% of the game is locked and properly paced at 30 frames per second. I truly believe this was the mode the developers intended players to use, and it is the default for a reason. Look, I get it, I'm disappointed that 30fps is starting to become common again, but as I said when discussing Starfield, I think stability is most important of all, and it does deliver that. And this is one of the few areas where Forspoken bests Final Fantasy XVI. It offers a 40 frames per second mode, something I hope can be patched in in the future. But when we get to the performance mode, things get a little dicey. So the first question I want to address then is, does the patch fix performance mode? And the answer to that is, 
No. Basically, in side-by-side -side tests, any improvements that do exist are rather negligible. It still consistently dips below 60 frames per second and regularly falls outside the VRR window of 48 hertz. But in testing, I discovered something rather strange about this mode. Let me demonstrate. So here I am running around the world in performance mode and you can see the frame rate slipping below 60 throughout, right? Now watch closely as I initiate combat with an enemy. Notice something? The frame rate suddenly jumps up to a near stable 60 frames per second. It's completely smooth and plays great. Here's where it gets weirder. The second Clive finishes the enemy and puts his sword away, the frame rate instantly drops once again. Turns out, when the developers mentioned that it was targeting 60 FPS in battle specifically, they weren't entirely wrong. Exploration is generally unstable, but combat does target and often maintain 60 frames per second. Even these huge battles with tons of special effects can deliver surprisingly decent performance in this mode. So what the heck is going on here? Well, as I see it, the answer seems pretty clear cut. The second you initiate combat, the internal resolution drops like a stone, as low as 720p. Image quality takes a gigantic hit as a result, and the game winds up looking more like an interpretive oil painting. But at least the frame rate smooths out considerably. My theory is that the developers intentionally boost detail during exploration, but then dial back resolution in other settings the second you enter combat. With this in mind, if you can tolerate the choppy exploration and bad image quality, performance mode isn't so bad for combat. But how could they improve it? Well, I don't know what their rendering budget looks like, so this is all just spitballing, but I think that settings should be reduced further during both exploration and combat, as frame rate consistency is most important. Beyond that, I think a reconstruction solution besides FSR1, or whatever it is they're using, should be considered. There may not be enough headroom, of course, and it's difficult to say for sure, but it does feel like there might actually be a path to 60, at least in theory. No matter which mode you choose though, all the game's cutscenes are displayed at 30 frames per second, ensuring good image quality during these major sequences. I think it's the right move. So in its current form, I would personally suggest sticking with the quality mode, but if you demand that extra fluidity in combat, the frame rate mode isn't as bad as you might have expected in combat exclusively. If you're struggling to deal with 30 frames per second though, here's a tip. It always feels most jarring when you switch from 60 back to 30, so don't do that. Instead, set the game to quality mode in the options menu before you load your save. Do not flip back and forth. This gives your brain and eyes time to adjust to the lower frame rate. Seriously, give it a try. But there is good news elsewhere when discussing performance, specifically in regards to loading times. Final Fantasy XVI features some of the shortest loading times this generation. In fact, there's no actual loading screen at all. The game simply dips to black, then fades back up for the next scene. It feels like an old school cartridge game in that regard. Even more impressive, if you begin from the PS5's home menu by selecting return to game, it will very quickly load after the splash screen, bypassing any company logos, and immediately drop you back into the action. It's just insanely fast. But okay, I think we've established the general level of performance you can expect from this game. Performance mode isn't great, quality mode is very stable, and the loading times are lightning fast. With that covered, it's time to move on to the final part of this video. Music stands strong as a pillar of the Final Fantasy franchise. One cannot overstate the importance of music in a game like this, so when it was announced that Masayoshi Soken, the mastermind behind Final Fantasy XIV's Sublime soundtrack, would be handling Final Fantasy XVI, I was excited. And thankfully, this excitement was well-founded, as Final Fantasy XVI's soundtrack is a true series highlight. The official soundtrack itself spans eight compact discs for a reason. There are a ton of tracks in this game, and every one of them is a work of art. From the beautiful remix of the series Crystal Theme, to the more evocative exploration music,
and beyond, there's a lot to love here, but it's the music composed for the game's set pieces that impress the most. This is Soken's specialty after all. Dynamic and expressive qualities create an immersive experience that captures the imagination and touches the depths of your gamer's soul. The music is so perfectly matched to the on-screen action that you'll nearly stand and cheer in jubilation. But it's not just the music that shines, the voice performances are also outstanding, possibly the best in series history. I won't ask you again, Wyvern. Take her head so we can be done with this. I... I can't. I won't. You would betray the Holy Empire? Betray? I don't recall ever pledging allegiance to your Emperor. My service may have been bought with this brand, but not my loyalty. Tell me, who did this, or I'll see you suffer the same fate. The man who delivered... who, who delivered the coffer said... He said Sid paid him. You run amok with the rest of your rats, and this is how you repay me? But there is one issue. The lip sync is only valid for the spoken English soundtrack. If you prefer to play in a different language, you lose this aspect, which is a bummer, because from what I've heard, the alternative voice recordings are also fantastic. At least the game supports proper surround sound and makes excellent use of the low frequency channel for some seriously deep bass. By now though, you may have noticed the exceptionally long runtime for this video. I apologize for that by the way, but the reasons are clear. I just really enjoyed my time with Final Fantasy XVI and wanted to talk about it. The storytelling and the story itself are among the best in series history. The environments are beautiful and the combat is simply sublime. Yeah, it's a little on the easy side, but it's just so satisfying to engage with. Yes, I do have some nitpicks, the side quests aren't great, the combat can be a little repetitive at points, and performance mode just isn't good enough, but honestly, beyond that, this game is a classic in my book, a real love letter from the team, and one of the most enjoyable games I've played in a long time. It's so good, in fact, that it actually makes me want to give Final Fantasy XIV more of a shot now. Which is something I never thought I'd say. As we draw to a close then, my final takeaway is this. When technology and art work in harmony, with glitches and bugs nowhere in sight, it allows you to truly trust a game, and really savor that experience. I've become so accustomed to covering games with serious issues and bugs at launch that I'd almost forgotten what it feels like to play something this solid. Between The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom and now Final Fantasy XVI, I feel reinvigorated, and suddenly our gaming future seems bright once again. And that brings our time together to a close. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, be sure to let us know, and I'll see you next time.